the origin of thinking. Yet, this does not mean that the lecture aims to provide just a timeline of events. On hearing the word origin, we tend to think back in time, we tend to think of what once was, what lies in the past, and we tend to think of the past as something that no longer really affects us in any substantial and meaningful way. It might be the strangest thing to hear that this origin is only in the past if we account for it historically. The origin in thinking is now. The origin is, to borrow a word from Heidegger, if it is our origin, our future. The German word for origin is Herkunft, and that means that which comes from somewhere comes to us from somewhere, and therefore that which leads us somewhere and gives us direction. And that which comes from somewhere is going somewhere. In tune with that, the German language calls future Zukunft, i.e. that which comes towards or that which is to come towards us. Thus we think the future is that which comes towards us from that which has been. The future is not designed by us, no matter how powerful we deem ourselves to be in our craze to erect perfect systems of artificial intelligence and artificial time. The origin is our burden as much as our mandate. Let me digress here briefly. Capitalism and its explosion in modernity to some is the working of the future on the present and the past. The future, unbeknownst to us, determines who we are, who we were, and what is now, and what has been, and what was. This is especially crucial when we think of artificial intelligence and how capitalism might be nothing but artificial intelligence working against us in nature from the future. And that these workings against us, humans, come from the future and it's uncontrollable by us. If that is the case, then a return to origin, to that which comes towards us from within and out of that which has been, is the proper human response to the utter destructive forces of technology and capitalism. Thinking the origin allows us to formulate our own future, a human future, and what's more, it allows us to formulate a human history and human future that do not fall for a crude Pythagorean humanism. The thinking that we can trace to what we now call the ancient Greeks is present even though it might be concealed to us. The origin is not the starting point. What unites or what gathers all of the thinkers we shall listen to in this lecture series is their language. Their thoughts, even though millennia away, still guide us and their language too. Nietzsche's Zarathustra says, thoughts that come on dust feet guide the world. We shall follow this word to grasp the attunement of this lecture series. The series intends to let this thinking, concealed in the melange of the everyday, come to the fore, to open our ears and to become aware once more of the great fire that in the early days sparked this thinking. This is a first essay, a first attempt also at the play of history and memory in one word of thinking itself that moves everything. On Homer. We begin with Homer's epic poems, for they give us crucial hints at an archetype of the European human being. Homer was a rhapsode, a chord singer. Rhapsodes wandered from homestead to homestead, offering their art to the nobility. Accompanied with a lure or simply the stick, they often sang of the great war of Troy and of the journey of Odysseus. For centuries, the Rhapsodes sang the great stories they had memorized. They addressed the muses first and begged them to sing through them. The mother of all muses and was therefore called Nemosune, which means memory. The muse sings to the Rhapsode, she remembers for him what is known, what has been seen, what has been heard. Homer was the first rhapsode to write down the great stories in hexameter measure. The first written epos, the Ilia, sings of the great war of Troy. It begins with the call to the muse, she shall, she shall sing of Achilles' anger. 
the muse shall sing, and it is only she who sings. The rhapsode is just the medium. The Odyssey, written a bit later, already begins differently. Andra moyen pe musa polutro pon hosmana pola plantite petries polietro me perse. And that means sing to me or sing through me, muse, or maybe even sing in me, and through me tell the story of that man skilled in all or many ways. That man is Odysseus. He is Polytropos, a manifold man, turned in many ways, to take it literally, and turned towards many things. We see here a fundamental shift. The verb soul is no longer just a medium. Now the singer asks the muse to address him personally. Sing to me, Moy, of the manifold man. In both epic poems, however, the repso takes a hearing, listening stance and mediates the great stories to his audience. Audience comes from the Latin verb audire, which means to hear. The story of Odysseus is the archetype of the European, European human being as the turning, searching, and erring man, pushing frontiers, always conquering, cunning. It is no coincidence that Stanley Kubrick would choose a subtitle for his film, 2001, A Space Odyssey, some 3,000 years later. The story of man, pushing ever further into the nothingness of space, beyond the boundaries of the Aristotelian continuum, now nothing but a geometric entity, guided in his travels no longer by the kiss of the eternal great generosity of the muses and their embedded memory, but seduced by a cold, vicious, rational, calculating, and apparently all-powerful computer. On Heraclitus and Parmenides. The 19th century enjoyed categorizing. They gave us historical accounts of how to think of any philosophy before Socrates as pre-Socratic. Nietzsche would call them pre-Platonists, for he believed Plato to be the most crucial thinker. Hegel called them pre-Aristotelians. The question for us is, do we learn anything from such categories? Or do we merely immediately presuppose something we do not really understand whence and why something comes to us? Are we in any way allowing ourselves to think if we let such presupposed pigeonholes rule while often even being unaware of them. This raises the question what thinking is and what it is that these, say, early thinkers have left us. Those have left behind for us before even the term philosopher was coined. Thinkers think. Thus they do not preach, they do not teach. They invite us to think they have left us with riddles and mysteries. The thinkers we now refer to as pre-Socratics are all concerned with the arche, with origin. Thales was, as far as we know, the first. The arche for him is water. Anaximenes believed the air to be the arche. For Pythagoras, the arche was the number one. What is most important, though, is that with the beginning of this thinking, Things are grounded in the origin and become an interrelated whole. It is a thinking out of and from within origin, arche. They ask for the relationality of things, of beings, for their belonging together. The world is no longer just singular entities, but now an interrelated whole, a totality. The first thing we should do then is to refrain from applying any categories of the, to the texts of Heraclitus and Parmenides they do, that they do not think in. For example, ethics, theology, cosmology, metaphysics. We learn very little from these early thinkers if we represent them in such terms. Also, the label pre-Socratics distorts their thinking. Are they in any way inferior to Socrates or Plato? It seems to imply at times that they are prior to something more crucial and that they are inferior to Socrates or Plato. On Heraclitus. We know almost nothing about Heraclitus if we account historically. We know he was from the city of Ephesus in Ionia on the coast of Asia Minor, which today 
is the Turkish Riviera. He lived, we are told, from around 550 BC until 480 BC. He might have belonged to the royal family and might have given his claim to be Basileos, king, to his brother in order to be able to continue his studies. His book, if there was one, has not been preserved. We have but aphorisms and quotes by him and other philosophers' texts. The textbook version of Heraclitus and very much the scholarly dogma in any philosophy department today is that he is the philosopher of the eternally flowing river, the world of flux, of constant change, where everything always flows, i.e. Panthere. Parmenides, then, the textbook story goes, opposes this view by proclaiming the stability and unmoving nature of being and that motion is just an illusion. Again, we are trying to move away from such assumptions and instead listen to what we, to the words of Heraclitus himself. Thus we are not interested in the person Heraclitus either, but purely in his thinking. We do not evaluate it as to whether or in how far it is consistent or whether there are argumentative tensions in it. Rather, by taking a listening stance to his thinking, we shall try to understand where we come from. Heraclitus is often referred to as the dark thinker, the obscure thinker. His thinking thus seems to be a dark, obscure thinking, a thinking that is somewhat hidden and concealed. It is not immediately accessible to the demands of common sense. This might be the reason why Heraclitus continues to be considered the philosopher of the eternal indifferent flux where nothing can ever be truly known. But we also have to think, why is he the obscure thinker? What is concealment? Now, officially, the story goes that we cannot step into the same river twice, supposedly Heraclitus said that. However, a river flows, does it not? Put differently, it's not what a river does, or rather is, does it not for a river to be a river mean to flow? More to the point, if everything were in constant flux, ever-changing, would that not mean that it is repetitively ever same? To common sense, this might make a lot of sense. The world is, of course, constantly changing. It is getting ever more complex, we are told, aren't we? More complex by the day, by the hour, by the minute. Do we live in a Heraclitean world of stable change? Would such a world not be a rather odd place, a place of great unfreedom, where nothing is reliable and everything just immediately attacks us, ever new, ever better, ever faster, ever changing, ever optimized? How could Heraclitus, in a universe of complete total flux, have been able to write anything at all? Would there even be language? Would there be letters? In a world without any gathering, supposedly, only flowing things and falling apart, collapsing and re-emerging. Are the things Heraclitus describes changing every day, every minute, every hour? Yet if one were to understand Heraclitus as such a thinker, and there was one disciple who did so apparently, how would one end up? His disciple Cratylus at some point decided to stop talking. He gave up what is almost to the human being. He gave up his language, his mother tongue. He dared only to lift a finger. Nothing can be said, Cratylus thought, for everything is always changing. Cratylus had misunderstood Heraclitus. Cratylus no longer stood in the Logos, was no longer addressed by it, did no longer belong to it, was merely in an effective nihilistic state. He took the teachings of Heraclitus to the most abstract and therefore could no longer be in the world. His problem was that he took the Heraclitean Pantare literally, nominally, and did not think it through. True, Heraclitus is a philosopher of becoming, as it were. Yet why are being and becoming supposed to be opposed to each other? What Heraclitus does say is, 
Into the same river we step and we do not. We are and we are not. That's the actual quote from Heraclitus. He does not say, as often claimed, you cannot step into the same river twice. Now, we could take Heraclitus to be a philosopher in the modern sense who wants to convey to us some propositional truth. X is Y, if X is Y, then that proposition is correct. The proposition corresponds to the thing in question. Then we would have to begin to apply all kinds of logical trickery to Heraclitus' proposition and find whether it is correct or not. We could make up words as they do, such as transtemporality. I am always change, changing, am I not? Am I still the same person next week? How so? If not, how could I know that I am I, or that A is A, etc., yada yada. And the river keeps flowing and flowing ad infinitum et absurdum. We need here only to mention that it would take 2,000 years for Occidental thinking to see the mediation at work here in identity. It would be German idealism, it would be the task of German idealism, to think through this fundamental issue. But it begins with Heraclitus, who does not leave us with a timeless, verifiable propositional claim, but with the deepest tension of thinking itself. A tension that breathes, breathes through thinking itself, that lets thinking weave and strive. Strange that rarely ever anyone seems to stop and wonder. A weird being, the river. Strange that rarely anyone wishes to encounter a river in a thinking manner when thinking through Heraclitus' dictum. Heraclitus does not leave us a logical puzzle, but asks us to consider the being that we call river and to encounter it. A being whose being means to flow. That is, the being of the river is precisely not stable standing subsisting, yet the river is thanks to its being that which flows, i.e. the flowing of the river is the very being of the river. Heraclitus invites us to think after that, to think being and becoming as one. Such a lyrical aphorism as his on the river is a riddle. It invites us to think of the being of beings, more precisely to think what it means for anything to be. If Heraclitus in being itself, there is always also the possibility of not being. Heraclitus is free in his play with these forces of light and dark, for he is free of, free from, what would become known as logic, dialectic and mediation. A crucial fragment of Heraclitus is what we now refer to as fragment 10. It reads, Physis cryptis die Physis likes to hide herself in the medial form, or Physis likes to conceal herself in herself and in something else in a sheltering way. Physis is not nature as we understand it today, even though Physis is often translated as nature. What we need to take from that is that being likes to hide itself, to self-conceal, and that this very self-concealing is the way in which being unfolds and unfolds as its own history. Yet what is the Logos Kratilos lost? Logos is often translated as reason, words, sentence, science, and rationality. It is, as any fundamental word of thinking, not simply translatable by simply consulting a dictionary. Why is that? There are Obviously, there are translations, there are dictionaries where we can look up the word, and there are thousands of sentences in ancient Greek philosophy texts where a translation such as reason or word or sentence make proper sense. However, we must bear in mind that the Logos itself is a fundamental experience of thinking. This fundamental experience, what the experience is, cannot simply be transferred to another language without having made that experience. And this is why the dictionary has to offer so many and such a variety of words. They're only they're getting at something, but not at the proper full word. The Logos confronts us still, and it does not. We can still hear a remote echo of it in words we use every day, especially if we're in academia. Sociology, psychology, biology, genealogy, 
the Logos here appears to be no longer there in original sense, which is concealed, yet it still addresses us. Logos here means science or a collection of truthful propositions written in a certain scientific subject. The tragedy of Gratulus is that he would give up on speaking and with Aristotle he would cease to be a soan logonichon, a living being in and addressed by the Logos. Gratulus gave up on this innermost relation, for he perceived the world to be but a permanent flux, so all he could do was to give in to an immediate intake of groundless sense data of things, but not beings that are in a totality. And the reason we speak of biology and psychology, etc., is because they want to give a totality, they want to give an explanation of a totality of beings. And so there is this shimmering of the logos still there, but it's not fully there. And once we give up on, on, on this kind of logos, then we are ourselves kratilos. We become scattered and are incapable of making sense of the world. A science of is an attempt to gather, to collect things, explain them as an interrelated whole. Now we read fragment B1 of Heraclitus, where the Logos is addressed. Quote from Heraclitus, For human beings are always ignorant to understand the Logos, both before they hear it and when they are hearing of it for the first time, even though all things take place or occur according to the Logos. One could, of course, assume, as is often done, that Heraclitus here means by Logos his own teaching that his fellow human beings are too simple-minded to understand his genius. But I don't think this is what's going on. In the first fragment, the ancient Greek word for ignorant is asunetos. Sunetos means understanding. The alpha is primitive. Sun means together. Thus, a more literal translation could be they are not coming together with the Logos, even though everything happens according to the Logos. Thus, it could hardly be Heraclitus' personal teaching. Why should everything happen according to his theory? Rather, human beings are fundamentally in an understanding of the Logos, even when they are not explicitly aware of it. The Logos is itself first there in hearing, in listening. Hearing is not exhausted, by the way, by scientifically measurable sound waves entering the sense organ ear. Hearing is not an effective process either. Hearing always concerns us. Hearing is what gathers the human being even when we're not aware. This is why in the ear, for no obvious reason, the human sense of equilibrium is located. The Logos touches us right there at the center for the Logos itself is that which gathers and concentrates. And when we, for example, read to our loved ones, to our children, we instantiate the Logos. The Logos is hermeneutic and apophantic, and that means that the Logos allows us, in the way in which we exist, the ways we are, to let beings appear as meaningful to us. Because all life is interpretation. Heraclitus distinguishes the hoi puloi and oligoi, the many as opposed to the few. Now one could assume the many are those who do not know the Logos and that only the few can ever know the Logos properly. Yet the many are all of us. Human beings are always the many, always in danger of failing to take on their responsibility of what it means to be a human being, i.e to respond to the call. Even though we are addressed by the Logos, we may not respond. We might give in to the Cratylonian temptation. In another fragment or aphorism, Heraclitus says, not having listened to me, but having heard the Logos, is what gathers onto the same and allows to say, it is, it is wise that one is all, Hen Panta. Human beings are in the world. A world of beings and of things, but they are not in it 
in an immediate sense. Thus, not in the flux of ever-changing things, a world of chaos and no grasp, but human beings are in the world mediated by the Logos, by their belonging to the Logos. It is the task of human being to think the Logos and how we belong to it. The Logos allows to see that one is all. What then is the original experience of thinking allowing the Logos? We here follow Heidegger's reading and expand when necessary. Again, the Logos is here not yet a purely technical term. The noun Logos is of verbal origin. It comes from legain, which means to read, to say, to count, but primarily to gather. Who reads gathers himself unto a text, lets himself be gathered, we can say. Someone who counts also gathers. The Logos is the gathering unifying of beings qua beings, that is, not just a flux of mere thing after thing after thing, but the Logos lets see the inherent order, order of, thing, of beings. The Logos brings to light what is concealed. It gathers into presence from concealedness, lets shine, and in that sense it is apothantic. That indicates that presence always requires unpresence, absence. Only as such can the Logos translate into word, sentence, reason, for it is for its gathering, which human beings respond to, that they can engage, for example, in scientific endeavors, which are but attempts to bring to light what and how something is. The Logos therefore hangs together with truth in the Greek sense, aletheia. Lethos means concealed, hidden. Lethe is the river of forgetting in Hades the underworld. The dead were taken across the river of, of forgetting, so they would forget who they were. Aletheia, which we translate as truth, thus means out of forgottenness, out of hiddenness, into presence, while respecting the lethos, the concealed. The Logos is what guides this. Man always hears the Logos, even though he might be ignorant of it. Remember, that listening to the Logos gathers and allows to see one is all. This is not a normative call to listen to the Logos. Rather, the Logos is the one that brings all things qua beings, that is, in their inherent relatedness, into presence. In the onslaught of beings, the Logos is what helps gathering, so that the human being is precisely not in but a flux of passing meaningless shadows. The hen panta is the way the Logos is. The human being is directly addressed by the Logos, belongs to the Logos. Psyches esti Logos eauton auxon. The soul is Logos, or maybe in the Logos, out of itself growing. This is why Aristotle defines the human being as Soan Logos Nechon, the living being in the Logos. The Logos discloses, unconceals what is hidden, Physis Gryptis Die that which is, or the way in which beings flourish, likes to hide. Here we can hear difference at work. Even what comes to the front, or into presence, still is absent on some level. And as long as we do not ask what and how beings are, they are but a flux of things without origin. The world, then, or rather the cosmos of which Heraclitus speaks, is not at all chaotic or of in, one of indifferent flux. The cosmos, Heraclitus tells us, is and always has been. Cosmos means good order. It is uncreated. Its arche is ever-living fire, regulating, as it were, with measure. The world is a world of opposites. We are and we are not. As we are born, also new death is born, as Heraclitus says in fragment B20. To common sense, of course, this is contradictory. To Heraclitus, however, quote, that which is opposed to one another is being brought together, and from that which is dissonant or different, there is a most beautiful harmony arising, fragment B8. It is this tension of being and non-being, of presence and absence, that allows for becoming. John Bernard adds, in a beautiful book called Early Greek Philosophy, these 
books like this are not written anymore. I don't know why, but they're not written anymore. The world is at once one and many. And just and that is just the opposite tension of the opposites that constitutes the unity of the one. This is true harmony. To put this in a formula, there is identity in difference. Heraclitus is a free thinker in the sense that he is not aware of this difference that he thinks, or rather that comes to him from thinking itself, simply because there is becoming that does not mean that all is in vain. That is what a weak common sense assumes, and that common sense is most powerful today in academic philosophy. You remember now that Heraclitus says we are and we are not. There he invites us to think the not, the nothing, or with an old English word, the naught, and its inherent relation to being, and to think it properly, not, say, nihilistically or existentially. Goethe's poem, One and All, speaks of that. I quote, The eternal strives ever forth in all, for into naught it all must fall, if ever in being it shall remain. The Heraclitean cosmos is thus truly one of becoming and passing. Yet becoming is not subordinated to stable being. Being and becoming are here one, and that finds expression in the river. The river is a flowing being. Its being is flux. It's itself becoming. In that cosmos, God is a child playing with time with eons, sending his thunderbolts. The thunderbolt, the flash, we have to wonder, does it come to us from that which has been, or that which will be, or both? Heraclitus, in any event, thinks being as growing, as bringing forth that which self-conceals. The being of the very river is hidden in the river itself, and it is this the reason why so many from Cranthalus up until this day are incapable of understanding this crucial insight into being itself. The old English verb, beom, still has echoes of this grasping of being and thus means all of the following, to be, to exist, to come to be, to become, to happen, to take place. And what comes to be, can come to be in so far as it can and must fall into nothingness. But modernity tells us that all stands perfectly present and positively given at all times and leads to more positivity by itself, to positive feedback. There is also in any case no room for spontaneous order in this cosmos of Heraclitus, one of the predominant notions of liberalism and the way in which modernity self-articulates. Spontaneous order purely emerges out of the future and must utterly disregard the past, must cut it off. It must actually be futuristic. With Heraclitus, we see already that we must be able to think the nothingness. We must be able to think the nothing, the not, the naught. We must be able to think negativity again. And this is how we can think of another way of human being in this world.